We hope you'll join us for new episodes starting in early 2017. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Julie Dameron, local veterinarian for over 20 years. I am so excited about my new radio show, Tales and Tips, on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, Voice of Stockton, and KXVS Radio. I will discuss relevant issues affecting animals and pet owners today, how to avoid common problems, and how to extend the quality of life for your cherished companions. As a community advocate, I will also discuss important social issues that affect our city. I plan to showcase organizations and heroes who are doing amazing things to help others. Remember to tune in every Tuesday morning at 10, starting soon. Welcome to another lively issue of Tales and Tips. Dr. Julie Dameron here, local emergency veterinarian, and we're going to have a great discussion today on social issues in our community. I have no Motikuzuma Patrick Sanchez, otherwise known as Motek. I have Stephen Bohorkas, otherwise known as The Chief, and we have Ted Gonzalez, otherwise known as Senior X. And we're going to be talking about immigration, we're going to be talking about the pipeline, and lots of other issues going on in our community. All three of my guests today have had a long history of helping others in our community in different areas. I'm going to start with you, Motek, and let's talk about what's happening on May 10th. May 10th, um, the Fair Oaks Library will be reopening. Its, its grand reopening will um, be taking place from 3 to 6. And so we want to invite and welcome the community out. It was a, a lot of effort that was put into getting the library reopened. And so now we want to go there to celebrate and make sure that the community is getting uh, full use of it as well as um, what they deserve from the city in, in regards to resources. Great. Right. And do you want to talk about, history, about how long the library has been closed and where that is in our community? So the Fair Oaks Library, uh, located on Main Street uh, in East Stockton, was closed, I want to say, late 2010 or early 2011. Um, and it was closed as a way to, during that time, the city was experiencing record deficits in their budget because of the downfall with the uh, real estate housing market that really uh, affected the entire nation. And Stockton was one of the hardest hit cities because Stockton's local economy is over reliant on the real estate market. And they had overbuilt um, in 2006, 2008, Stockton was one of the fastest growing cities in the United States in regards to real estate development. So that boomerang really came back and, and hurt us big time when uh, the economy crashed. And so the city started cutting everywhere they could. They started laying off city employees. They started um, reducing their, their hours of service, which even still today, uh, City Hall is closed to the public on Fridays. So it's pretty much closed 20% of the time to the public. So one of the victims of that that was uh, caught on a chopping block was Fair Oaks Library. And the reason for that is because the other libraries in the city were uh, either had grant um, requirements that they could not close it or uh, were the, the most circulated, had that most traffic. So there was a, a lot of reasons. So um, Fair Oaks became the nominee to get put on a chopping block. I also feel that that happened because of the neighborhood that it's in. They, they feel sometimes that, you know, it, you can make easier decisions from a government standpoint if you're doing it to people that aren't gonna uh, push back. And so it was closed for that many years. Um, when Stockton emerged from bankruptcy and we were recording a record surplus, um, we came back, uh, my organization, Samias, came back and said, okay, this is gonna be one of our priorities that we want to, as one of the ways of pushing literacy and, and increasing educational outcomes in Stockton, we need uh, to, for the community to have access to the resources and one of the primary ones is a, is a library. And so we made it a priority of ours to really push for getting that reopened. And so the first, we also at that time discovered that it was on the chopping block to not only get uh, closed, which was supposed to be temporary. It was supposed to be a temporary reaction to 
the Great Recession and, and the budget deficits that led us into historic bankruptcy. But what we discovered was that it was actually on the chopping block to be sold off as surplus property. So wow. the city had no intention of ever reopening it. And uh, when we found that out, that was the first move that that was the first battle we had to fight in the road to getting it reopened was number one, getting it removed from the surplus list. And when you say we, who was working with you to try and get this library reopened? So we, uh, when I say we, I'm speaking of my organization, Simeus, um, but so we were the spearhead of it, but we had really built a community coalition with other organizations, a lot of individuals that participated in and um, um, gave a great effort, wrote letters to the editor, showed up to city council meetings, donated books, um, uh, helped with our petition, both online and, and uh, in person canvassing the neighborhood. Um, so it was a, a big coalition of a lot of individuals, awesome. and including the gentlemen uh, that are with me today, that really led to the effort in, in getting this library reopened, really against, uh, surprisingly so, against the entrenched opposition of uh, the city administration. Okay, and Ted, I'm going to come back to you. How far is the library from where your office is located? It's probably about less than a mile. Okay, so this also serves the same community that you're working with. Can you talk about the impact on the residents and the children with not having this resource? Well, um, well first of all, I wanted to thank um, Governor Don and Julie, Julie for having us here today. I want to thank Motec Sanchez and Oset, also uh, Stephen uh, Bohorkas has been a really important part of our community and uh, we also we're out there collecting signatures for the petition to keep the, the library open or fight against City Hall so it would be reopened. And uh, we canvassed the area and, and the, kids, the kids would otherwise be in gangs if the library isn't open. The, the library needs to be open because it's a positive for those schools that are there, Franklin, Roosevelt, Lottie Grunsky, all these areas, we have a lot of youth who are running around and they're lost they come to my office they go, I don't know what am I gonna do what am I gonna do you need to learn you need to go back to school but the library is closed the library closed they don't care about us City Hall doesn't care about us so that's why I'm proud to be part of, of Simeas and I'm part of, of being this uh, this interview today because the library will be open it was a lot of hard work but I'm proud to say that those signatures made the difference and the citizens of East Stockton will be heard at City Hall and not only the signatures, but I was there at, at the city council meeting when the vote was cast, and several people, including Motec, came up and spoke very powerfully about how important this library is to our community. And I know there's statistics that show that for every dollar you invest into the library, the returns are exponential for the benefits to the community. Stephen, did you want to comment on the library? Um, only to the fact that it, it took a lot of walking uh, <laughs> to get those signatures and uh, door to door canvassing. Uh, How many signatures did you guys have? Uh, what was it? A thousand? Yeah. About that. Sure thousand. About that was thousand. just what they did. Right. And then we had more right. also with our uh, crew in person, uh, an additional uh, several hundred. And then we had. Um, I don't even recall how many we had online. We had an online petition on change.org also. Yeah, yeah your organization did a huge number of uh, signatures. Mm -hmm. but just your organization alone, huge. It was a huge. This Again, those signatures are, are extremely important. Okay. Extremely. Uh, so, it, you know, and going to City Hall, like what Motec did, what Ted did, and what I did, and, and all the other supporters who came up in front of that microphone in front of the City Hall, like you said a few moments ago, was very powerful and passionate. And that, those are the tools that are necessary to get the job done. So I'm very happy to see that the, the Ferris Library is opening up. Thanks to two, these two guys. <laughs> and uh, it's exciting, it's, it's yeah. exciting. It's gonna yeah. benefit multiple future generations. Right. That's, it's it's you know, one of those things that, you know, they always say you can't uh, fight City Hall and win, right? And we won this case. Right. And it was actually five different times that we we had to take it to a vote. Wow. Um, and and the, the fourth time, we took it to a vote we got we got the votes and the funding secured and then we actually had to come back a year later to redo it because even though uh, the city had the city council had allocated the funding to reopen and fund the library for the first year 
they did not put it as a line item in the budget for that year. So when we went through the budget, we had we figured that out. We said, hey, wait a minute, you know, they're trying to pull a fast one. And then we had to go re-argue and basically refight to re-secure that vote, to put it back in the budget when we had already gotten that vote uh, a year prior. And what kept the motivation going after going to council so many times and get not getting the results you wanted? Um, well, I think, you know, not to speak for, I'm sure they can answer on their own, but for me, I think it's, it's a, a sense of uh, passion for my wanting to see my community do better. And knowing the fact that this is affecting a segment of our city and population that are not used to, number one, understanding how the process works to, like, like I just mentioned, looking into line item budget and all that kind of stuff, to, um, or to feel empowered to go speak before city council or to, or to walk door to door, sign a petition, share links online or whatnot. So it was that passion of saying, you know, this is about the betterment of the community and long term we want to see our city improve. And if it's going to uh, turn a corner, so to speak, then it's going to take a lot of these little battles that we need to win that eventually will create an environment that is more conducive for everybody. Yes. And that's great. And part of why I wanted to have the three of you here today is all of you fight for people in our community and you give a voice to people that don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to Stephen because you represent a different segment of the community that doesn't have a strong voice. Mm -hmm. You were the original founder of the Red Circle and mm -hmm. I'll have you talk about that as well as the American Indian Movement if you wanted to Thank speak you. on that. Sure. Uh, just to piggyback on what uh, uh, Mark said a few moments ago is that uh, for me personally uh, on my behalf is, is, is the Native Americans. I want to make sure that the children of the Native Americans. There are 100 tribes that live in the city of Stockton. Wow. Yeah. And most people don't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. So whenever we, um, uh, going uh, back in the day, um, my father started the Native American in, uh, Tutor Center behind Edison High School many moons ago. Uh, um, and uh, even, even though he, you know, he started it and then he went on into his career as an x-ray technician, um, the center that he started grew and got bigger and then it split her off and became the powwow committee which that committee it uh, now uh, does the Native American powwow here in Stockton yeah. every year at UOP. So it's, and of course that's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. So we do have a community, a Native American community here that, that, that is lacking uh, information. Uh, that to me, for, there's a lot of kids out there and a lot of uh, adults out there that are in the dark. It's, it's, it's critically important that our kids plugged in and got access to computers, access to books, a place to go to do their homework, a place to go to do their research. A, place, a safe a, place. A safe place away from gangs like uh, Senior uh, Gonzalez just said a few moments ago. Uh, Stockton is just a dangerous place. I'm sorry, it is. Um, it's a dangerous world we live in. And having a library uh, is a safe place to study and to is, uh, uh, it was, for me, it was critically important. That's why I was going door to door with uh, Ted Gonzalez here and, and supporting Mazazuma and, and speaking up at City Hall uh, on behalf of the children, if anything. That's, what, that's why I did it. I did it for the kids. And Ted, your facility also offers programs for the children. Can you talk about what you offer, the different services? Um, uh, basically, I'm working with um, all of Stockton. You know, anybody can come to my office. I wanted to make that clear, uh, and I wanted to let everybody know that uh, I am a former city councilman for the city of Stockton, and while I was there, we always supported Colleen Foster and the library, because it's important for our children to be able to go to a library and get information so they may attend uh, further education at the, the Delta College or the other schools that are available here in Stockton. In my office, uh, we offer um, job referrals. We offer uh, help for the students. A lot of the students are are confused, and they're walking around, and they think that if you sell drugs, you're going to get a brand new car, and you'll be wearing gold, and you'll be a, a way ahead of everybody else. They're not thinking, and this is why uh, it's important to get the information out that a lot of the youth have avenues to get out of poverty. There's, there's a way to get out, and that's through education. 
So this is why I'm here, and, and I think it's very important that the youth, they do come, they do come to the office because we have immigration rights, we have job referrals, we have English, we have several things that are going on in the office that anybody can come in and it's free. Awesome, everything's that's amazing fair. that it's everything's free. Everything's free and, and uh, we invite the community to come. We've invited uh, Mayor Tubbs several times, several times on the gang issue and on the library. Almost 15 times I appeared at City Hall and Mayor Tubbs refused to meet with the public. So I'm very disappointed because back in the 90s when I was on the City Council, everybody, everybody had a right to come and speak for five minutes. Everyone had a right to come and meet with the City Council or Mayor Joan Dara. And we were very effective. We worked with the City Manager. We worked with everybody and we progressed and we made Stockton safer. So I, I think that the youth need to come to the office. We're located at 1632 East Harding Way, right down the street. And uh, we're involved with the community. If you want to come, a lot of youth come and they they have complaints about City Hall. So I invite you to come and I will take you to City Hall so you can air out your complaints. All right, thank you for that invitation for people. Motek, I wanna go back to your organization. Can you talk about how that was founded and the different services and things that your organization specifically fights for? Mm, I got the idea as a graduate student at USC, um, working on my master's degree in 2014-15, and um, you know, I reflected on my own academic success and recognized that uh, it was due greatly in part of my mother always taking me as a young child to the library here in Stockton. Um, you know, we were poor, we didn't have a lot of money, we didn't have a car, so we used to have to walk to the library. But, um, you know, I, I developed the love of learning and, and acquiring knowledge and seeking knowledge and, and uh, reading at a very young age that really paid dividends for me throughout my years in school, high school, um, up in, into college. And so when I graduated, um, or prior to graduating, I, I founded the organization and you know, since then we've been very busy in uh, promoting literacy. So we have uh, book drives that we do and we um, deliver books to classrooms. And Wonderful. Uh, we let the kids keep the books, take them home, encourage them to, to build up their own personal libraries in their homes. Awesome. Um, in, engage the parents to understand the value of reading uh, for the children at an early age, how that will pay dividends later. Um, advocate for um, communities such as with Fair Oaks Library or uh, any other kind of policies that we, we may feel are needed to change in the community. Um, but we're also a, a social justice uh, organization as far as, you know, we, we can say that we want to uh, kids to do better in school and our community to improve and people have good jobs and all this kind of stuff. But it won't happen if there are certain uh, conditions that continue to persist and so our way of, of trying to address the larger concerns and the larger issues is is strategically going after some of the smaller ones that we can affect um, and as a friend, literacy is one of those things where you have to really work at it and plant that seed um, at an early age and you won't see those those dividends pay off until many years later mm -hmm. it's, it's not like it's going to turn around the community overnight but our community didn't get uh, the way that it is with a lot of challenges it has overnight either. So we're really trying to address things that are immediate, but at the same time, long term. Um, and, and complex so, problems are not solved in a day. Oh, not, not <laughs> at all. And, and Stockton is, is like the, uh, uh, I like to say it's like the Petri dish for addressing problems, right? If we can solve things here, then you, you can, can solve take them anywhere. anywhere. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so, um, that's that's what we do you know we advocate we uh do things like uh work with other organizations and and do uh public barbecues to promote unity as as a way of combating the uh high crime rate and violence we have in the city also we do things like that in the summer where um we did two of those events last year at, at victory park and we gave away hundreds of books to, to children in in the uh community and it's it's um uh, i've heard this kind of argument several times when we were fighting to reopen Fair Oaks where people um, misguided I believe w had this notion that 
people don't care about books anymore so therefore nobody cares about libraries libraries are outdated and all this kind of um you know this sentiment right and and as somebody who's benefited from libraries um i know that's to be not true but you could see it still when we would pass out books to uh children in the park it was like uh, the excitement on their face, it, like they were getting Christmas presents. Well, right? And our city just had a big read event. And yeah. several important people in the community were out reading to children. Yeah, and, and so that's important to see because that didn't exist a couple years ago before Samia started doing our thing. But now you're seeing more people do that. And that's something that we like to see. We like to see what we're really trying to do is affect the culture of our community to say these are the things we value and these things are what we need to fix. Yeah. And so we're trying to also do that with our with our own um, certain demographics, which is, you know, uh, low income uh, uh, Mexican uh, community as well as uh, really any any community uh, African American uh, white that is challenged in in kind of overcoming the obstacles that our community has for various reasons and so that's something that we are very passionate about um, we are we're, so you're uh, helping the underdogs yeah so you know be, because and, and it's really helping um, it's, it's giving back, right? I, I've personally and, and a lot of the individuals that are part of our organization that volunteer their time are passionate as well. We've uh, found success in various ways and we've learned lessons over the years that have led to our success or, or how to run a business or how to write a paper or apply for college, all these type of things. And so rather than uh, us kind of just strive for our own personal success is it's like a, a responsibility that because we've overcome these obstacles we've come from those communities um that are plagued by these challenges it's it's a responsibility of ours and a passion of ours to then turn around and give back to help more children okay. to be able to uh follow our path and it's just going to multiply right it's just going to pass i just i remember we were giving an interview a tv interview and in front of the library and i i think it was your son broke out a book Mm. and started reading it Aww. and it was really it, I, I thought that was it was perfect and it was exactly what Motek is talking about what kids need this I mean anyone who has a computer or a laptop right you need your reading skills you know you need those typing skills and um, the more high the, tech we get the, the, the more, more the more ability of English bilingual the more education becomes more of a silver bullet mm -hmm. uh, or in my case a silver arrow mm -hmm. but uh yeah, it's it's very important to get those skills, and um, the light. I'm sorry, there's a lot of people out there that just don't have the same economic status as a lot of other people do. Education it, can level that. Yeah, education can level that. Education can actually help you excel and motivate you to the top of the ladder, or the top of the pyramid, or in the the center of the circle. But um, uh, uh, having a, a library and a um, in a poor neighborhood helps the children climb that American dream, climb that American Definitely. ladder. And uh, it's a way out of the ghetto. It's a way out of the barrio. It's a way out of the reservation. It's a way out of Stockton. If you Go know. back to the reservation. So mm -hmm. earlier I mentioned the Red Circle and we didn't get to hear right. about that. Talk about right. the Red Circle. The Red Circle, I, um, it really uh, started with the, the um, an organization that I started in uh, Lodi, California. And the way it started was the, the powwow committee uh, in Stockton uh, were having different issues about, you know, how things are done. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, we separated, basically, is what happened. A question of leadership of what it was. I won't mention any names, but basically that's what happened. So there we were. Um, uh, I believe it was at the Outback on, on uh, March Lane there. And I'm eat, enjoying a steak. And uh, we're having with, with my, my crew, and uh, I suggested, you know, we should have our own powwow committee. And they says, well, you can't have two powwow committees in Stockton. You, you know, one works. And that's basically how us tribes operate, one tribe at a time. So we said, well, I, t I suggested the name. I suggested the location, Lodi. And instead of just having it in one place at one time, we can expand. We can actually go to schools and. Uh, do dance Native American dance presentations to the kids 
Native American dance presentations to elders in the retirement homes because a lot of people just can't go to a powwow because of their illness, their health. Um, some are disabled and they just can't go. So we go to them and we do that for the ki- cool. you know, the kids at the schools and, and it's great for teachers who, again, back, back, enrichment to, back, to cultural, back to education, back to education. And that's basically what Red Circle is all about, uh, a cultural education. Uh, a multicultural democracy focused through higher education. I'm always about that. So um, that's what we did. And we really got kicked off in 2007, kicked that off really well. And then um, um, I moved on after I was their chair- first chairman and uh, I gave them the name and we got a powwow uh, going in at, uh, uh, the uh, Elk Grove Regional Park uh, off there off Eight Mile Road. And uh, it, was, it was done very well and it was well received. But um, again, you know, times change, the economics change, uh, there was a death in the family, uh, so you know, other, other factors involved. Life happened. Life happened, life happened, so yeah, that's okay, you know, we had a new chairman and he did very well, but you know, things just kind of, I don't know what ha- I think what happened was a lot of the kids grew up, had kids of their own, that's what happened, so, <laughs> so but um, uh, it's, it's okay, we're, we're, uh, Red Circle is still around. Um, we just got to get that kicked off. But again, we've been busy with the campaign work and job and paying the rent and life, you know, so going to school and well, so forth. Well, and you but said this was started in Lodi right. and then filtered into Stockton. And it just fits because Stockton is such a diverse melting pot of so many cultures. Yes. It's to me one yes. of the things that makes our city so magnificent. Um, now when you talk about the powwow yes people are involved and the event is very Mm -hmm. big but there's also a lot of political issues that have been coming up recently Mm -hmm. related to the pipeline and such yes the the oil pipeline in south dakota it was was a huge issue even the last powwow i went to was at at, uh, edison high school uh, excuse me over at uh, uop and of course the, the mc he got on the mic and he mentioned, you know, you know, that's how that's how we do it the old way. When we go to powwows to get the information, what's happening with other tribes, what's going on, and, and that's basically how powwows really got started. Um, two medicine men came together and started talking, and it just went on and on and on. And, and uh, we still do that. Ironically, we uh, the American Indian Movement is a good example. They still go to powwows, and when they make an announcement on the microphone, they're letting the other tribes know what's happening in Dakota, what's happening in, in, on the reservation. Uh, they did that in 1973. Uh, I actually started in 67 in San Francisco, of all places. Um, the issue of the Alcatraz Island, uh, which is a, really a Native American sacred site. I it, didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, it's a, it's a Native American sacred site. Before the white man came, this and was very, very different. And built a prison on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, they retook it because of the civil rights movement, because a lot of the Native American civil rights were just being trampled on, you know. Technically, I'm not supposed to be here, right? I'm not supposed to exist, according to the great white man's master plan. So, um, because we fought back, my tribe and family are still here. Few and far between, but we're still here. Um, The American Indian Movement took over Alcatraz Island, uh, to make a stand against uh, civil rights violations against the Native Americans. It lasted for like 71, 72 days, and then that stopped. Um, moved on to uh, DQ University, where we took uh, over the, the school, because uh, education, trying to get better education for the Native Americans, which was being ignored. So um, the American Indian Movement took over that school, and it was actually a military base. And we, we took it over, and the, the military, instead of you know, having a fight, they just said, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Um, it's still there. Um, then we moved on to another civil rights violation that would be against the Native Americans that took place in the, the Rosebud Indian Reservation. Oh, and there's been multiple violations. <clears throat> I'm going to have us jump forward mm-hmm. to current day, and I'm going to have MoTeC talk about what it was like going to the actual pipeline uh, where the fight was. Yeah, so um, myself and and other members of Samias went out to Standing Rock in North Dakota, and um, when was this? And this you went was, a couple times. Yeah, September. Well, 20. we went. Yeah, yeah, we went the end of September, and we were there uh, really just a couple of days, and then we had to come back. We uh, 
you know, rented a car and <laughs> and drove up there 23 hours and, and stayed there and then drove straight back. We got to see a lot of America that none of us had ever uh, personally seen before. I've never been to the parts of those country. Um, what was it like when you were there? Give us a sense of what it felt and what felt like and what you saw. It it felt well. There was tribes there from all over the United States, but also from other countries. Uh, we met a shaman from uh, Central America, um, or actually the son of a prominent shaman. And then we met people who were coming there from. I met somebody there from Japan. Uh, met we met people there from Canada. We met people there from other places of California, from Minnesota, all over Florida. And if, you know, the greatest word I could use to describe the, the feeling there was just community. It was a sense of community from everybody there, a sense of purpose, a sense of um, being part of something historic, because this was the, the largest gathering of tribes in the United States for how many tribes? if not the last hundred years uh, almost, since, almost, since almost, in time is you know right. written uh, not to interrupt but it, but it, there's over 200 tribes there now wow yeah so it, it was a pretty uh you know we were it, it, it was a sense of being part of history and then learning about the struggles and, and interviewing people who were who were descendants of survivors from wounded knee uh, mm -hmm. massacred that occurred in uh, 1888 i believe yes. um and learning how this was uh, not something new for a lot of these people, as Stephen was uh, talking about right now, but just yet another chapter in a long history of struggle and learning how uh, corporate and, and kind of economic interests, such as oil, an oil pipeline, mm -hmm. can really have an impact on the environment, which then in turn has an impact on uh, geography and uh, people. and and. You know, so we've seen disasters like the spill in the, in the Mexican Gulf a few years ago, um, and there's you know several. It so that leads to doing more research, more data. What is the concern with oil pipelines? How many spills are there in the United States every year that never see the light of day as far as mainstream media? And that was something that was very concerning to this uh, the Standing Rock a Sioux tribe. Um, who was also part of the same tribe that you know, uh, Crazy Horse and and, and um, yes. Red Bull, not Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> Are you thirsty? <laughs> uh, city, City Bull. <laughs> city Bull comes from. So we actually went to the graveside of, of City Bull, right. um, and so th they have a long history of of fighting back and struggle. We went to the reservation. We didn't just go to the camp, but we actually went to the reservation, talked with um, locals. Um, was there fighting going on when you were there? Were there people giving speeches? What what, what was actually no? So happening? we we actually uh, we went there prepared for a fight, right? But <laughs> it just so so happened that that weekend we were there, it was like uh, there was a break because there was no construction going on to go fight against, and so we got to uh, really spend our time talking with people there, interviewing them, getting a, uh, accustomed to their uh, purpose and, and um, their position. And so, you know, there was there was a sense of love and community. And uh, I, w I was really impressed in how organized this, really a pop-up camp was. I mean, they had a medical section. They had, um, you know, women who would come in from, uh, white women that were coming in, they were, they were masseuse and they were volunteering their services to, anybody that was there and giving free massages or they would have people helping out with like the medical that you know all these little areas set up and so everybody had to uh cook for themselves so you would see these huge pot these community pots of like uh buffalo stew mm -hmm. and you know that i got to have and, and getting uh, hungry you know it, we got we got invited into a um a TP and, and, and spoke with some elders who were the descendants of survivors of, of Wounded Knee and they were telling us about you know the treaties and, and the pipeline and how they're connected and mm -hmm. how really this is a result of uh, treaties not being respected which is nothing new in American history <laughs> so you see a, a continuity of the mistakes of the past not being learned from in regards to uh, our federal government and that's why it was such a victory when uh, President Obama at the time finally uh, late in the game came out and um, 
denied the easement permit for the construction company to build along that uh, that pathway, um, which was overturned by President Trump. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, the, the struggle continues. The fight goes on. And um, it's something that really is not just affecting the Sioux tribe in Standing Rock, North Dakota, but it's really something that everybody should be concerned about because the main purpose of their fight was that this pipeline was going to be built through uh, a river that they rely on for water. For, mm -hmm. for water. It's their water source, mm -hmm. but also their food source. Mm -hmm. And so if something leaks or spills, you know, that's like right here in Stockton, we have the Delta fight. Mm -hmm. And 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 to them, it is just as important, if not more important. I mean, for our Delta to collapse, that will have a domino effect to, Huge to impact. Right. impact so many other, uh, you know, our local economy, Farmers. our health, our Food. everything. And so it's it's really on that level of concern for the community at large, but right. we have to look at it on a on a greater scale and look at it on on a national level and even global level to understand what are we doing to the environment that is uh, going to affect our children and our grandchildren later down the road and Seventh impact generation in a negative right. way. Right. That, yeah. I want to go back and talk to Ted okay. about a different fight that's happening not only within our city, our state, and nationally, and that's immigration. Um, I know yesterday there was a big march downtown Stockton about immigration, and tomorrow night Susan Eggman is having a forum. I'd like you to talk about immigration and residency and citizenship and just the fight and what people can do. Well, this is a, um, a, a fight that's been going on for me since um, I became the city, city councilman and uh, immigrant rights is close to my heart and I believe that uh, Stockton is a great city we have a lot of great people here uh, when I ran for city council a lot of people uh, jumped on the bandwagon with me a lot of we had a lot of uh, good people not just uh, Mexican people all peoples all races so immigrant rights is very important to me uh, because I can see that families are being torn apart. Uh, there's a big fear factor going on right now. And on Saturday, uh, I attended the uh, immigration presentation, and I wanted to thank the League of Women Voters. I wanted to thank Mrs. Uh, Sayang from the uh, Immigration Office in Sacramento, and Ms. Gonzalez from the Catholic Social Catholic Charities. So these. Uh, the the um, presentation existed uh, from 1886 to 1901 to present. So the immigration has been constantly changing, and uh, it's, at first the borders were open. Then later on, after World War One, we started getting more more picky of who's coming into the country. And then in, during the World War Two, we needed farm workers. We asked the Mexican government to please send farm workers because we didn't have anybody to pick our crops. So now we moved up to Trump and, uh, and we're back to the same, the same uh, hypocrisy uh, that's been going on for years in this country and that is it's time to blame somebody so why not blame the field workers and the immigrants and build a wall. After Ronald Reagan tore down the Berlin Wall, we have another wall going up. And what we're going to have in the future, That's I believe. That's a very good point. Hmm. I believe that is uh, just like in Oregon and Washington during the 80s, we're going to have these farm workers, these farmers and ranchers sue the federal government because they don't have any workers. And if you don't have any workers to pick the vegetables and the fruits, guess what's going to happen when you go to the market? The prices are going to skyrocket. And uh, I just, I just think that we need to be more sensitive. Um, I'm asked that the um, Stockton Police Department and ICE please be more uh, more careful when we are picking up uh, these people who are just ca came here for workers. I believe the criminal element should be deported. I believe that people with bad moral character should be taken out of this country. We don't need those kind of people here. But we are standing up over here in my office. We are standing up for families against deportation. It's, it's, it's very awful. How would you like? if your wife was picked up and deported. And we have reports that a U.S. citizen was deported. Okay, it was yeah. reported on Channel 19 just a few days ago. And uh, he, was an, uh, he was picked up and deported 
because he had traffic tickets. And this is unbelievable because not even the INS representative knew what's being reported in Sacramento. So uh, a lot of people don't know their rights and we are standing up uh, for them, not just me, but a Senor uh, Magana and uh, Mr. Sanchez over here with Simeas and also Mr. Bohorkas. We all stand together because this is Stockton and Stockton is a great city. And, and we want Stockton to continue to be a great city. Uh, some of the things that uh, we're giving out information to is uh, some of the immigrants are very upset, not just Hispanics, not just Latinos. You have East Indian, you have Filipino, we have Chinese, we have Russian, we have all these different countries, all these different immigrants are running, they're upset and they're scared. So uh, we ask that the people listen and please, if you have a pencil, take down this information. If you think that somebody in your family or you're going to be deported, you must keep all your paperwork together. That means if you've applied for political asylum, if you've applied for citizenship, keep the paperwork together. The ap immigration applications, your driver's license, uh, number three, your lawyer's name, address, uh, uncles or aunts. Uh, also, you need someone who's going to take care of your, your family if your mother and father are deported. Uh, also, if ICE comes knocking on your door, you have the right to remain silent. Do not answer the door. If they, order, if they take you down to the deportation station, you have the right not to sign a voluntary deportation. They cannot come into the house unless they have a search warrant. If they take you to the deportation station, do not sign voluntary deportation because you may qualify to be in this country. And so it's, it's, it's confusing because the debate, has, the debate has come back again because of our new president and, and this wall supposedly that he wants to build. And Nazi. Mexi Mex Mexicans are not the invaders. Mexicans are not the invaders. Okay, let's go back. If Trump doesn't understand, I'll explain it to him very clearly. 1846, we had a war. Okay, United States took, took California, Arizona, and Texas from the Mexicans. So this is completely outrageous that we have to go back to the Treaty of Guadalupe that was a broken treaty, that our people were supposed to be left alone. They could have their language. They could have their citizenship. And how many people that have been deported in the last six months, who's to tell if they were related to the, to the Mexican-Americans that were here during the war in 18, 1846, 1848, when Stockton was incorporated? How many were deported that are related to U.S. citizens? So if you were born here, then you're a U.S. citizen. So it's, uh, we're out and we're, we're fighting because we believe that this is um, a terrible thing uh, that's happening in our country and it hasn't affected yet, but it's gonna affect the market, it's gonna affect Wall Street, it's gonna affect us Americans. Uh, when we go to the store and buy our groceries, we're, always seeing, we're already seeing a surge in the cauliflower, we're seeing a surge on the price on the avocados, mm -hmm. the meat, the milk, Everything is going up, so doesn't it's going to hurt the working class and the working poor. So we ask that please be uh, sensitive to what's going on in our community, and uh, yes, we want to get rid of the criminal element. And can you repeat one more time the address of your office and give us an office phone number so that people know how to contact you? Yes, uh, my address is at one six three two East Harding Way. Phone number is two zero nine. Six zero three three four zero nine, and uh, face or email is Ted Gonzalez, o two at gmail dot com, and we're there from uh, nine thirty to three Monday through Friday, and so we're available, and um, all my services are free. Awesome, uh, Motec, give me just one second, ahead. please give the address of your facility and the hours and phone number and whether you're on Facebook and whether you have a website. Uh, well, we're located at 42 North Sutter um, on the fourth floor, but we don't have set hours uh, because we are comprised of an all-volunteer army, so to speak. And so our events and our activities vary. 
Um, but my phone number is 209-518-8120. Anybody can feel free to reach out to me anytime. We have uh, our Twitter is at Samias C-A. That's S-E-M-I-L-L-A-S-C-A. Um, we also have a Facebook page set up that you can you can uh, message us anytime and we'll respond. And, and we have um, several events that will be coming up over this, this the rest of the spring and the summertime for people pl- plenty of opportunities for people to get involved awesome awesome and steven i'm sorry i cut you off did it's you okay. have a uh, comment that's okay yeah. um that my only comment was the reason why i brought up the american indian movement and brought up the, the red circle and, and so because history is repeating itself history is repeating itself dramatically the violations that took place back in 1822 to today 2017 it all, it's all repeating itself 73 to 75 um, it's all repeating itself with the the, the desecration of Native American land uh, cemeteries really they're putting oil pipelines through cemeteries um, it just history is repeating itself what's happening to the Mexican American community what's happening to the Native American community what's happening to our water well uh, what's happening to the the prices the gas Donald Trump um, in my opinion is probably the worst president we've ever had um, and just to, just to t- uh, touch on, on what's been happening recently in the past couple of months with the oil pipe on April 1st, 2017, judge orders, a federal judge orders the gas uh, pipeline to be shut down on Native American property. Uh, there were 38 Native American uh, landowners in that uh, region, none of which was uh, compensated for because of the, the tra- trespassing of the, uh, the government or the company, I should say, the oil pipeline company um they have exactly six months to remove the oil pipeline uh in its structures uh judge vicky miles um uh, wrote a 10-page uh discussion on the u.s uh, district uh, courts um in western district oklahoma uh, the court finds that the permanent injunction uh, should be uh, entered into the case and uh, uh their land which has been invaded by the, the presence of a p- oil pipeline uh, it continues to be used uh, for this pipeline. Um, CBS News reported on April 4th, 2016, the Keystone Pipeline has been shut down uh, after a crude oil uh, leak in uh, North Dakota, of all so places. There's already been a leak. There's already been a leak. Most people don't know about that, but there's uh, uh, already been a leak in Northern uh, Dakota, very near to uh, the borderline of uh, Canada, which this pipe, Keystone Pipeline happens to be a part of, part of the, the Canadian uh, um, corporations here, uh, the Trans-Canadian uh, Corporation, uh, shut down the Keystone Crude Oil Pipeline uh, after the leak was detected Saturday afternoon in, uh, in excuse me, in South Dakota. Um, uh, there was an investigation, of course, uh, to remove, uh, um, it was near a remote area in Hutchinson County, uh, South Dakota. Uh, it is not clear how much oil was spilt, uh, but the cleanup is underway. I have no idea how many gallons of oil is involved. Um, and how would you find out? Let's say that I, someone wanted to. Well, for me, I, it's always through the, the Native American community, through, uh, also through Facebook is an excellent example. Um, but I, a lot of times I'm on the phone, you know, talking to, if you, I'm, again, uh, <laughs> I won't mention any names or organizations, but uh, I do have a, a connection with the, uh, the Native American community. Um, and so they're, they're the ones that fill me in, by the way, Stephen, this is what's happening. Um, and then, of course, I turn do the same thing. I let other people, other organizations, such as the American Indian Movement, what's been going on. Um, also the Native American Heritage Commission uh, and father, other organizations as well. Um, a lot of it is just individuals. There's a lot of individuals. They don't belong to any organization, but they stay in touch with the media. Um, a lot of the information I do get from uh, media sources. See, and to so. me, tonight, I mean, this afternoon, we've talked about so many relevant issues. It's obvious that there's so many important things we've discussed that are affecting our local community, our state, and national. We'll have to set up to have another round table, part sure, two. Sure, it's so much. <laughs> Yeah. As we're wrapping up, I'm going to ask each of you just to make a, a brief final statement. We'll just we'll start with Motek. I uh, just want to tell every, you know thank thank you for having me and um, everybody. Like I said, there's plenty of opportunities to get involved. Uh, you you can 
you know um help to be the change you 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 have to be that change that you strive for um you have to get involved you have to speak up speak out even when it's not comfortable and even when it's not um sanctioned so to speak by the status quo or the powers that be somebody has has to fight for the people who have no voice somebody has to fight for the people who don't know the game who who are uh being impacted directly and negatively by decisions that are being made by by uh people in in positions of power and so we're going to continue to to do that we're going to continue to promote um a culture that values uh learning and 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 brotherhood and and uh community and and empowerment and we're going to continue to fight for things like like uh reopening fair oaks um and i just want to reiterate that everybody needs to uh, take advantage of that library reopening. Support that. Uh, but the fight is not over. And when is that? That's what? next Wednesday, May 10th uh, from 3 to 6. There's going to be a grand reopening event. Um, and the thing about that is is there's so much to be done in Stockton. There's so much to be done. And so um, while this is a victory, you know, there's so much more that needs to occur. In matter of fact, including with Fair Oaks, we're not done with Fair Oaks because it's reopening but it's only operating part-time so that's something that we want to change because we want equity in in library hours throughout the city that if one uh, side of the community has full operation of the library then we expect that of the other side of the community well, and as well. measure m was passed and so maybe some of that funding yes. can trickle to fair oaks so that's something we'll be pushing for we we want you know re, uh, re restoration of services as they were because the thing is people are not only still paying the same taxes before the library was closed in that neighborhood but we're actually now paying additional taxes with mm -hmm. measure a mm -hmm. and measure m and and uh, you know, we're paying the highest sales tax in, in the state, and we want to see uh, the community receive their just dues. Okay, Stephen, quick statement. Uh, apologize for not being able to say what I needed to say. So I guess it's to be continued. So. Ted? Okay, I just also wanted to thank um, Donna, Donna Brown over at the library. I wanted to um, thank also Gary Ingram, who is Assistant City Manager who sat on measure A for listening to me and, and we got the library open. We're really happy, we're celebrating over at on Harding Way and Wilson Way. We are continuing to clean up the area of crime and prostitution. And just one quick uh, comment to the people out there in Radio Land. The squeaky wheel always gets the oil. So if you come to City Hall, you will get results and you will get help. Our future over here at, on, at my office is to continue to work as a volunteer in the city of Stockton and help the cleanup of Harding Way and Wilson Way area of crime and prostitution. And again, I wanted to thank uh, Julie and uh, Governor Don for being and inviting me. Thank All you. right, and thank you to our audience and our viewers. I wanted to give a shout out to All Creatures Emergency Clinic and to remind everyone that there is a Tower Up event this Thursday night at the Ave. Come support our radio station so we can have more important programming to give Stockton a voice. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Julie Dameron, local veterinarian for over 20 years. I am so excited about my new radio show, Tales and Tips, on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, Voice of Stockton, and KXVS Radio. I will discuss relevant issues affecting animals and pet owners today, how to avoid common problems,